Welcome to Auto Mundial, the weekly car news and review show where this week we have a track battle as we pitch the Hyundai i30N against its new, smaller sibling. We also have Porsche's latest 911 Targa, as well as a new SUV from Volkswagen, the Taos. Plus Aston vs Bentley, who makes the best V8 Grand Tourer. That's all coming up, first though, the news. Supercar startup Zynga has broken the production car lap record at Laguna Seca. The American brand's 1,233 brake horsepower hypercar broke the record previously held by the McLaren Senna by more than two seconds with a time of 1 minute 25.44. Driven by American racing driver Joel Miller, the Singer 21C used road legal Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2 R tyres, with Miller describing the powertrain as completely mind-blowing. 21C has a central driving position with a tandem passenger seat behind. The twin turbo V8 has been developed in house and has an 11,500 RPM red line. It also has a pair of electric motors on the front axle and can drive up to 12 miles on electric power. When one is buying a luxury Grand Tourer, it's easy to believe that more is more. But with V8 versions of Bentley and Aston Martin's 12-cylinder Continent Crushers now on offer, do they represent a more sensible option? Or do their V12 and W12 counterparts still offer ultimate GT opulence? The Aston Martin DB11 has been with us for a while now, but if anything, it seems to be getting even better looking with age, thanks to its timeless coupe design and sensibly sized front grille. It follows the same classic GT recipe as all of its DB forebears, with a big engine up front under a long bonnet, a luxurious 2x2 cabin behind that, and drive going to the rear wheels. It's pure Aston and very unlikely to be mistaken for anything else. But it isn't just shaped to look good. It's covered in clever aerodynamic touches to funnel the air for maximum downforce without the need for vulgar stick on wings and splitters. It looks great from any angle, just as an Aston should. Inside, however, the styling is not quite so convincing. The V-shaped dash design doesn't quite seem to fit in with the rest of the car's flowing looks, while the dated infotainment screen looks to have been carelessly plonked on top. That said, this is still an Aston, so while we may be a little pernickety about the aesthetics, this is still a wonderful place to find yourself in on a long journey. The materials are fantastic, with gorgeous leather and wood everywhere you look. On paper, the turbocharged Mercedes power plant is totally outgunned by the flagship model. It's hardly a slouch though, 0 to 62 miles per hour is dealt with in just 4 seconds, only a fraction slower than the heavier V12. And it's the V8's weight that helps it stand apart. With four fewer cylinders sitting under the bonnet, the DB11 V8 is nimbler and more of a driver's car than the V12 Cruiser. That said, however, the V8 will still settle into a comfortable cruise like a proper GT. And then we have this, the new Bentley Continental GT V8. Every bit as imposing as the W12 model, with only the extra tailpipes and some badges marking it apart from its big brother. It's a familiar VW Group engine that we've seen in everything from the Porsche Panamera to the Lamborghini Urus. Like the DB11, the V8 Continental misses out on the big numbers of its 12-cylinder counterpart. 
power is down from 626 to 542 brake horsepower, while 0-62 just pips the Aston at 3.9 seconds. Unlike the Aston, the Bentley sends its immense power to all four wheels. Grip and therefore year-round usability mean this could easily be used as an everyday car, especially with the V8's improved fuel economy of almost 24 miles per gallon. But even in this budget version, the big Bentley is all about luxury and refinement. The interior is in a league of its own. The sheer quality has to be seen to be believed, with only the finest materials on display. At first glance, it may look a little glitzy, but the more you look, the more details you spot. For day-to-day -day use then, these cars are arguably better choices than their bigger capacity siblings. They're cheaper, more economical and still immensely fast. But if money is no object, there's still something magical about 12 cylinders. And now part one of our Hyundai Hot Hatch track battle. Hyundai versus Hyundai in a high octane track battle is not a concept we would have believed possible even five years ago. Nowadays though, with the N division in full swing, I20N versus I30N, tested here with a new dual clutch gearbox, is a very real and rather mouth-watering prospect. The new 1.6 litre 201 bhp I20N is the underdog for sure not least because it costs 10 grand less than the bigger, more powerful, but 315 kilograms heavier i30 NDCT. But around a track as short and technical as this one, well, the little fella's extra agility and its brilliant chassis might just cause an upset. So, i30 first, let's see. Just when you think you know everything there is to know about the just surprisingly excellent Hyundai i30N, they're going to stick a dual clutch gearbox in it and make it even better as far as I can tell. I'm in end mode and I've got all the traction and all the aids, all the electronic aids turned right off because that's the quickest way. And it feels quite stiff, does the i30N. Always did, but they, I mean, this one feels even stiffer to me. And it does feel rapid down at these straights. It's quite heavy though, this car. It always was quite heavy in the dual clutch gearbox. Adds about 40 odd kilograms. But it's, and it's got a bit more torque. Surely it has to be quicker than its little brother around a track like this. Surely it does. It must do. It costs £10,000 more. But the lap starts there. The lap stops well. Oh. Yeah, it's pretty good through there. But you can feel the, feel the weight. Yeah, and that works nicely through there. The diff. You get on the throttle, the diff just pulls you back in. Works a treat. The gearbox also works a treat. But into here, into this, into this slow chicane, as you can see, I'm having to leave more room just because it's quite, it's quite a lot of car to get slowed down and it's not that neat through there either. It's very good through this corner out onto the back straight and then when you get onto the straight it goes anywhere the lap stops there, it really does go properly down the straight itself. 47.1 is the lap time. That's quick. But I know what a Civic Type R does around here. Or I know what a Civic Type R GT with the big wing and the 20 inch wheels does around here. And it ain't nowhere near that. I don't know, I think the little fella, the little i20N might, might get quite close to that. No, it couldn't do, could it? <laughs> I guess there is only one way to find out, as they say, and that's to try the i20N next. 
Join us again after the break for more track action, plus the new Porsche 911 Targa. Coming up, new releases from Porsche and Volkswagen. But first, part two of our hot hatch track battle. Okay, so that's a decent time from the new dual clutch i30N, but not an unbeatable one. And it's actually a couple of tenths slower than the slightly lighter manual version we timed a year or two back. Anyway, time to see just how good the brand new i20N is to drive on a track like this and how quick it is against the stopwatch. This thing feels absolutely cracking from the moment you climb inside it. They clearly know what they're doing at N Division at Hyundai nowadays. The i30N has already proved that. The DCT gearbox version has proved that again. And just look, I mean, it just makes you smile when you climb inside this car. It feels quite high tech, but deeply sporting. However funky you think it looks on the outside, it looks just as cool on the inside as well. Six-speed manual gearbox only, if we like that. End mode, just as you have with the i30. 201 horsepower from this little 1.6 litre turbocharged engine. But as ever, the key thing with the i20N is how little it weighs, 1,220 kilograms. Anyway, this is all about a lap time today. It's nowhere near as quick down the straight. Our lap time starts there. It doesn't feel as rapid down the straight as the i30M, but straight away, breaking into that chicane, it feels much, much more agile. Don't have to take off as much speed. Lovely turn in through that bottom corner. Third, get a little flash on the dash to upshift. And one more poke in a straight line, but you can leave your braking so much later. Lifts a wheel when you turn in, of course, as all funky, proper hot hatchbacks do. Feels really good through this little tight bit. Absolutely Harry flatters through this corner, out onto the back straight in third. But again, I want more poke, but the lap time stops there. <laughs> oh, man. That's outrageous. It's two tenths slower, only two tenths slower than the i30. That shows you how much difference weight makes. So you've got 201 horsepower instead of 280, 278, 275 newton meters of torque versus damn near 400 in the i30. You've got an extra gear ratio in the i30, so the ratios are closer. But you've got over 300 kilograms less in this car, and that is why it has just got within a whisker of the i30's time. That's wicked, that's cool. And do you know what? I think I actually think, I think I prefer this one to the i30, to the original, purely because it is more agile. It, you can just put it to within a half a millimeter exactly where you want it to, whereas the i30 just starts to wash wide in places and you definitely need more space in which to slow down. Core blimey. So that was a tight one. Tighter than we expected, to be honest but it really does show just how excellent and how quick the new i20N is. Both these N cars are great hot hatchbacks, but of the two, it's the i20 that's now the most impressive. It's just a peach of a car, to be honest, and the fact that it costs 10 grand less is actually just a bonus in the end. Some bonus, 
and some car is the new i20N. Volkswagen has a new SUV for its North American lineup, and here it is the all new Taos. The smallest model in the brand's SUV lineup for America, it sits below the Tiguan like the T Rock does in Europe. Named after a town in New Mexico famed for its art and historic architecture, the Taos has very much been designed with Americans in mind. Its styling is more conservative than its European equivalents and there are no hybrid versions on offer. Instead, the Taos uses a 1.5-litre petrol motor from a Jetta, putting out 158 horsepower with two and four-wheel drive versions available. Despite being the smallest SUV in the range, it is actually a little bit wider than the world market Tiguan, and its long wheelbase and tall roof make it one of the roomiest and most usable cars in its class. Rivals like the Ford Bronco Sport and the Kia Seltos may offer more style, but nothing gets close to the Taos in terms of sheer practicality. Climb inside the roomy cabin and you're greeted by typical VW build quality. It's built to last and is a noticeable step up from many of its domestic rivals. Base model S versions get decent standard kit, but it's worth stumping up the extra $4,000 for the SE, which gains a modern infotainment system and a load of safety tech as well as fancier upholstery. Volkswagen says it has no plans to bring the Taos to Europe, and with cars like the T-Cross, T-Rock and Tiguan already doing a stellar job of filling just about every crossover SUV niche, we can't say we're that surprised. Nor are we particularly bothered. The T-Rock is a much more interesting car, and there's even an R version. When Ferdinand Porsche designed a convertible 911 in the 1960s with a legislation appeasing silver roll hoop, little did he know just how successful the unique body style would become. Named after the famous Targa Florio race in Sicily, the Targa was an instant hit and one of the safest convertibles on the market. Since the original of 1967, every generation of 911 has had a Targa. By the 993 and 996 generation cars, the Targa was little more than a glorified sunroof. But in 2014, the silver hoop made its return. And now, there's a new one. As with the previous generation cars, the new Targa is only available with all-wheel drive, meaning you get a choice of Carrera 4, Carrera 4S and Carrera 4 GTS trims. There's also a limited edition heritage design model that harks back to Porsche's early days of motorsport with some nice stickers and classic details. Naturally, the intricate folding roof system adds a fair bit of weight. In C4S form, it adds 40 kilograms over the regular cabriolet and 110 kilograms to the coupe. It's unlikely, though, that the extra heft will put off many buyers. After all, the Targa always sells well and is considered by many, us included, to be the best-looking model in the whole 911 range. In standard Carrera 4 trim, the Targa puts out 380 brake horsepower from its 4-litre turbocharged flat 6, good for 0-62 in 4.2 seconds with the optional sports chrono package and a top speed of 180. 
Next up is the C4S, which gets a big boost in power up to 444 horsepower. The 0 to 62 sprint drops to 3.8 seconds, while top speed climbs to 189. At the top of the Targa tree sits the GTS. This throws in a lot of the optional equipment from the 4S as standard, while power is now up to 473 bhp. Acceleration is improved once again, allowing for a 0-62 sprint of 3.5 seconds, while top speed is increased once more to 191 miles per hour. All of this glamour and performance does not come cheap though. The entry-level Targa 4 starts at a shade over £100,000, climbing to almost £125,000 for the GTS version. Join us again next week on Auto Mundial as we preview the all-new Audi RS3.